Hi everybody and welcome to the Surface Interval in association with the Two Minute Foundation. Today we're talking about when not to go scuba diving. There has been a part one to this video uh, that were just popped up somewhere in one of these corners of the video, but there are obviously plenty of times where you shouldn't go on a dive. As bright and fun as the advertising is, scuba diving can be dangerous and is always important that you never let yourself be sort of press ganged or pressured into going onto a dive that you don't want to. But if you're not sure on what some of these red flags can be, and when you should be skipping a dive, here is Never Go Scuba Diving When, part two. Yeah, hopefully this one is pretty well driven into you during your intro courses, but going up too far above sea level after a scuba dive is just generally a bad idea. Even after a normal recreational dive, we still have excess gases dissolved into some of our body tissues. Some tissues can flush it out pretty quickly, but others can be quite slow, so those gases kind of stick around for a while. And if you know anything about half times, the rate actually slows down that you're getting rid of stuff the longer it goes on. So you do have quite a lot of dissolved gas for a fair amount of time after a dive. If you suddenly go up and reduce the pressure around you, like going up an aeroplane or even climbing up a mountain, it's like swimming up too fast at the end of the dive. And those gases will start to expand in places where they really shouldn't be expanding. If you have plans to go on a flight or travel uphill quite far the following day, then it's best to skip the dive and just not risk it. Always remember that recommended times and things are all kind of educated guesses that should work for everybody, but the human body is quite complicated and we're all put together slightly differently and you don't want to suddenly discover that you are the exception to the rule by going in an aeroplane and getting hurt. If the weather's been rubbish for the past couple of days, then all of that rainwater has just washed all sorts of toot from the land out to sea and just stirred everything up. Raining during the dive isn't actually that bad. It's actually quite cool, in fact. Um, you get this really weird, cool surface pattern when you look up, that's kind of unique. Um, it can make things a bit darker because the light suddenly starts bouncing around everywhere instead of straight through the water. But a flash of lightning is pretty cool during a dive. You think it's a photographer taking your photo, but it's really not. Um, and you're pretty safe from lightning in a huge body of water. Uh, it's just the kind of the getting out that feels a little bit weird. Bad weather just makes your dive that much harder though. High waves kind of rock you about and it just abuses you when you're trying to get back onto a boat or trying to crawl out uh, off the surf. About five meters under the surface, it's lovely and serene and quiet, but up around the surface, it's a real bit of a pain in poor weather. You're moving, the boat's moving, there's rubbish visibility because everything's been stirred up and on the deck, everything is just gonna be soaking wet and just rolling around unless it's literally lashed down. If you're into that, it is a fun time um, that you do need to experience at least once, but if you only wanna die for an easy time and to see some nice things, then give it a miss, uh, give it a miss when the, the weather kind of picks up. On a weekend uh, around popular drain training sites, uh, like with learner drivers, uh, everybody was a learner at some stage. It's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. They, they have to learn somewhere. But if you've waited an entire month or your work week or something to go diving and you go to a popular dive site just to test out your equipment or something, something with nice easy entry points and things to see at shallow depths, a nice easy dive for you, you're probably not gonna see them because the schools will have their groups of students who aren't too good with their buoyancy yet, just kicking all the silt up and just ruining the visibility. Going on dives is much like tourist destinations. You want to avoid the peak times and the days and try to visit them slightly out of season when they're quieter or the harder to reach more obscure places if you don't wanna fight around the crowds. Even finding somewhere to park nearby on a weekend can be a nightmare. It's all very well and good that this guy here can be that much closer to the beach to walk his dog, but now I have to carry all of my dive gear that much further because I have to park half a mile down the shoreline. If you're planning to dive at the weekend, allow for crowds, parking, and of course, poor visibility. 
One of the big tests just before a dive is to check your regulator and take a few breaths. Sure, it's the pre-dive to make sure that your regulator is functioning properly, but it's also a chance for you to taste and smell the air that you're gonna be breathing for the next hour or so. Normal air, doesn't usually smell of anything, depending on who's in your immediate vicinity. But the most important thing for a scuba diver is that there's nothing nasty in the vicinity of the compressor inlet when they fill your tanks. It's hard to describe a bad air fill, but if you taste a, like an oily taste or a smell, something that just the gas doesn't seem quite right, then ask a few other divers on what they think, um, because it might be in your head, but hey, try and ask a more experienced diver, someone who might have smelt these things before. Carbon monoxide from an exhaust doesn't taste or smell of anything though, but you usually get the exhaust fumes along with it that you can smell or taste. If you're ever in doubt about the air that you're breathing, then the best bet <clears throat> is just to swap tanks and obviously mark that contaminated or potentially contaminated tank. You don't want someone else picking it up and then not doing that test. And if your air is old, um, that could be quite dangerous. It's incredibly rare, but some divers have actually died because the air in their tanks had reacted slowly over the period of a few months in storage and actually created carbon monoxide inside of their tank, even though they just thought it was normal air. If your air is over six months old, empty it and just get a fresh air fill. It's not that expensive. The contents can change over long periods though. Most scuba diving takes place in lovely tropical waters, but before long, you can still get cold. I mean, I used to teach in a swimming pool that was kept at about 30 degrees Celsius, lovely and warm, but an entire day in that water temperature, it's always slowly sapping body heat away from you. And when your body is cold, a few things happen. The blood flow to your extremities starts to reduce and chemical reactions start to slow down. If you've been nice and warm at the start of the dive, then you've been absorbing lots of gas. But now that you're cold and there isn't as much blood flow to your hands and the actual surface of your skin, so that dissolved gas can't be flushed out at a fast rate now that you're cold and it kind of stays where it is. A lot of dive computers don't actually take water temperature into account in their algorithms because the dive computer doesn't know how much exposure protection you're wearing, how thick your wetsuit is. If you're, if you're cold before you even get into the water, it's best to just cut your losses and skip the dive. Pop over to our Simply Scuba website and check out our ranges of thicker wetsuits whilst you're skipping that dive and dry suit undersuits, of course, to help warm yourself up for the next dive. But never skimp on exposure protection. You need to keep your body at the perfect natural normal temperature throughout the entire dive and in between dives as well. If you're cold, then you increase your risk of decompression illness. And that's it. Those are the only ever reasons why you shouldn't go on a dive. No, obviously there are more reasons, um, like if you've just been hit with a tranquilizer dart or the water is literally green and bubbling, um, I'd probably skip that dive. But let us know in the comments why you've ever skipped a dive and when it's not safe to go back in. Pop your thoughts down in the comments below. You guys know what to do. Thank you for watching everybody. Don't forget to check out the Two Minute Foundation for all the great stuff that they do. And of course our website, simplyscuba.com for the latest scuba gear.